FM. Welcome along to another disability live podcast. Um, and today I'm joined by Connor Mc. Um, how did, how did you say McCarthy? McCarthy. Yeah, McCarthy. I know. McCarthy. So yeah, I'm joined by Connor. Let's just say Connor Joey. Um, and he has MD. Um, and you're a contact better and a disability speaker. So welcome along. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, I really appreciate you having me on. No, it's all right. Um, so um, the so you're from Ireland, Republic of Ireland or Northern Ireland? Which probably Republic of Ireland. <laughs> Brilliant, good. Um, and so, so obviously you've been being part of a quite a short uh, population. How was life as a young kid? Yeah, it, it wasn't too bad. I think for me growing up, um, I did, of course, have difficulties with my disability. And, and, but I had a really um, supportive system in place. I went to school like any other kids. And, and um, yeah, I didn't really let my condition stop me. To be honest, I've sort of like blanked out a lot of things. So I don't really remember a lot from that time. But I do remember um, the good things and, you know, being able to go to school and, um being quite close with people who were in my year group um, when I was that young age. Um, I think I only realised as I was growing up how difficult it would be with a disability um, because I feel like when you're young, you're quite sheltered, whereas when you grow older and you experience things, that's when the problems really come in. Yeah, yeah. because as a child, you're kind of sheltered away from it or when they're really kind of a bit older, you're like, oh, this is how it works. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's just a bit like um, when you're growing up, you really experience it. Um, and yeah, when you're young, it's sort of like, oh, you know, this is fine. Everything's going great. And then, yeah, <laughs> things start to change. And so with that, um, so, so did you have a slow progression with your disability or was it when you were growing up? Were you able to walk? Were you in a wheelchair? What was the, what was it like for you? Yeah, so when I was growing up, I was able to walk. Um, so with my condition, I have uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, so it's like a muscle wasting disease. Um, so when I was growing up, I actually used my wheelchair a tiny bit. Um, from before I was the age of like four, I would say, and um. For Duchenne, they use steroids as a sort of um thing to sort of treat as such. So that helped me with my strength. Um, and I didn't use the chair as much after that growing up. Um, so, yeah, I was walking, but I was never perfect. Like I couldn't run or like I couldn't jump for anything. So, yeah, it was just really the bare minimum. And with school, uh, college, um, or mainstream, school, mainstream learning? Yeah, it would. It was. I was in mainstream learning, and um, I did have the option of uh, extra resources as well. So I used to go in primary school to like an extra resource class, and then in secondary school, I did that. I didn't really like it though in secondary school because I felt like I wanted to fit in with everybody else. And um, so, yeah, things definitely did change. And um, after that, I did a um course in broadcast and media, and yeah, I didn't really need any like extra help or anything and um, which was really good like I was just able to do it I think it was because I was very interested in it I think like going in school you're learning so many different things and you're sort of like am I interested in this am I not interested in this so yeah it was a bit different college for sure. So when did you, when did you know that you were interested in that particular role? I think since I was like like sort of like a kid I would say like I always loved technology and um, of course it's changed so much in like the last 15-20 years but um, yeah I always had an interest and I always wanted to do something in that field I think um, my family would always say to me like oh you should do something with computers and everything and I was like oh yeah you know maybe but as I grew older it became more so like I, I like creating things so I like editing video I like um, creating posts and creating my own content that's how I sort of really started. I, I think as well, COVID, when COVID-19 came, um, that was when my sort of urge to 
um, do content really, you know, became a thing because I had time for that. I'd, I'd never had time. So after that, I was just a bit like, oh, I'm locked in my house. You know, what else am I going to do? And I was like, oh, here, look, you know, I could create content. Um, and that's what I did. Yeah. And you've done quite well because you managed to get a tick from Instagram. Um, yeah, yeah. I know, which is crazy. Um, it was one of my stories, I think, that... Um, it happened so I did like a like a douche and awareness day post and so many people shared it it was like over 100 people shared on their stories and then a couple of I think it was a couple of days later I woke up and then I was like oh you're verified and I was like what is going on like I've only like two thousand followers or something like I'm not like a you know I mean I, I always call myself a small content creator so I mean that's good because a lot of people get that far and they don't have a tick at all so yeah it's crazy <laughs> Oh, look at you. Um, but yeah, you've done you've done some amazing things over the last few years with social media and all that. But I suppose you're kind of lucky to have grown up with technology and to have grown up with the way things yeah. are working now compared to if you were born 10, 20 years earlier, you probably wouldn't be yeah. in this space at all. Um but the first because I went I went through all of your LinkedIn and so all of these things we've done. So um we should go back to school. So um to join school before you went on to college, um what was your GCSE did you do GCSEs, A levels? The way that it works in Ireland, well the Republic of Ireland I should say, is um it's a little bit different. Um so we have a system where it's the junior cert. Um so we would do that for our first three years. So when I was 12, I started in secondary school and we called it over here. And I did my leave and sir, I think I was like 15 or 16. Um, junior sir, I should say, not leave and sir. Um, leave and sir I did when I was about 19. So um, that's how the cycle sort of works. So my first three years was up till junior sir. And then my three years after, because I did a year called transition year, which is a year where you can do um various different things with your time um so yeah my second term then was four years so yeah I wasn't really great in school to be honest and um, it wasn't my favorite place so I was just happy when I was out of there I loved talking to people and I loved being around people but the work part for me just wasn't for me yeah it's the learning process that you don't want to do in it really yeah yeah because you did um uh broadcasting and media at Bally, Bally Vermont College of Further Education. Yeah, so that was my college actual education. Um, so that's what I did for that. I did broadcast and media studies in uh, Bally Vermont, which is a place in Dublin, um, in, of course, Dublin, Ireland. <laughs> I don't think there is any actually other Dublins around the world. I'm not too sure. Or maybe I could be wrong. But um, yeah, I did that and it was great. I have to say it was very busy and very he head on um, doing it. I know I had 13 modules um, in one year, which was absolutely crazy. But um, it was definitely worth it. I had a really good time doing that. So the modules, it's four or five in September to December. Then another four modules or five modules in January till... Easter and then after Easter till my mom yeah split, split like that in it yeah so I, I think for me with mine it was I did a course before that so we did photography and that's the way it was it was like I think like four or five and then four or five again but this course was like 13 just for the whole year which is crazy I think maybe one or two modules changed but yeah I'm not too sure and that's funny actually how I can't think of that now um, but yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, and then you went on to do a film production. So it's something completely different. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, broadcast and media, film production. So it's always been different areas I've been interested in. So they sort of like interlinked to each other. And so yeah, film was something I was very interested in. But I think the broadcast and media side was something I was even more interested in. And um, I do love video editing, but... Yeah, I just love being able to um, work with a team and being able to create content with them. I think that's really fun. Yeah. And that was at, oh, God, yes, Dagro College of Further Education. 
Yeah, uh, Klaus de Dulig, I know. It's a very hard name to pronounce. Um, so I did that course as well. Um, I actually did that first before Ballyferma and then uh, Ballyferma came after that. So um, I know it was hard because film photography, um, I did it for a year, but it was during COVID time. So I think I only ever got to go in twice. And then after that with Ballyferma, I went in, I think it was like four days a week or something. Um, so yeah, that was really fun. But yeah, that's been my journey sort of um, until then. Yeah. And we'll come back to that one. I'll come back to that bit in a minute. But so I should probably start looking for your uh, your various job roles. So <laughs> started off with oh there we go. Twenty twenty to twenty one, you got involved with Hear My Truth. That was with the National Youth Council of Ireland. Yeah. Quite a nice official title. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, that was a really good program. How was that? Was it really, yeah, yeah, it was pretty good. Um, I know they actually got tr- um, in touch with me through my social media work, so that's how I sort of formed a relationship with the National Youth Council. Um, and here, my true, it was a program for people from different backgrounds to come together. And um, I think it's like twelve or thirteen of us, and we would um speak at different events, and um, we would just be allies for each other as well. Um, anything that needed to be done and somebody couldn't do it, you know, they would get on to say me or somebody else in the group and just say, here, look, do you want to talk on this? And they're like, yeah. So it was sort of like we were sort of champion and um, champion and um, like different types of people in our society. And is that how you got into the um, disability speaker world? Yeah, so that would have been how I got into it. Um, it was through that and sort of through my social media because I've always been one of those people who's posted things where it's like long, like really long captions. And um, I've been more like a storyteller in a sense. Um, but social media has been a way where I've been able to promote my stories, um, which is really cool. But um, yeah, that's how I sort of got into it. And um, yeah, that, I love the National Youth Council. They've always been great. So 20, yeah, quite a busy 2022. By the looks of it, you started off with lead up with the Irish Water Association, and you were an outreach ambassador for them. Yeah, so I did that work for quite a while. Um, we um did a program called the Daisy Program, and um, yeah, it was teaching kids about people with disabilities. Um, so what I would do is I'd go into schools and talk to kids about disabilities, and um. We had like a course sort of set up through that. Um, so there was a lot of like groundwork to it. And then I would do the um, thing of talking to the kids in the schools um, and we would do coursework and stuff like that. So yeah, that was a really, um, another really uh, fun role that I had. And um, the IWA has been another great um, asset to me. And um, yeah, that's really it explained. So that's sort of what the project was about. And when you were going around those schools, um, did you notice any other people with disabilities? Because obviously, I know, um, Ni- 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 Niamh Simbley is over there as well, and a few other contact crazies around there. But um, is there a big population of disabled people in Ireland, or sure? <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, in, in, in like the country as a whole, say, there is a big population. I would know in the Republic there is, and in the North, of course, there is as well. Um, and it's only getting bigger. Um, I think I see a lot more people out who have like physical disabilities, which I wouldn't have seen as much of when I was younger. So it is like great to see. Um, but I wouldn't know the statistics as such. Um, so, yeah, but there is um, a lot of disabled people out there. This is the bit that was quite interesting, actually. You were an assistant producer for Night Time at Classic Kids Radio, Ireland. Yes. So I did that role for about three months. So I was in college and um, I was able to get some work experience with Classic Kids, um, which is a big radio station in Ireland. And um, yeah, I was able to do that. And they were um, quite impressed with the work experience I did. So they said, here, look like we'd like it to be um, on one of the nighttime shows and um, maybe one or two nights being an assistant producer and I was like cool you know I'll do a Wednesday night and be the assistant producer and um, which was really cool like it involves a lot of things such as um, ringing up people to come on the show which was very interesting there was a lot of interesting people 
and um, yeah, it was it was quite a fun time. Um, being able to talk to people, get guests on the show, be able to um, log in the calls, of course, and um, yeah, just get to work in that environment, really. Yeah, that's it. Sounds like it was um it was a massive massive day there, and um, I'm so I'm surprised that I'm surprised that it was it was that only um a work experience. It wasn't after that you didn't want to go back back or. Well, the thing was with it was, um, like I did the work experience, then I actually worked there for three months. Um, but, but I got a different opportunity after that, and I couldn't keep it up. Um, I actually, like, had to with my job that I got after that. Um, like you weren't allowed to do any other type of jobs on the side, so I had to say here, look, like, I just have to give this up. Um, so yeah, that was sort of the decision that I made at the time. And, and then you did, um. You did quite a lot of things last year. The other thing you did was you were an admin assistant for Walsh Gibbons. I said, yeah, I did. I did that actually in twenty one, and um, so I worked at that for a year back in twenty twenty one. Um, and yeah, it was a good experience. It was just like one of those things where it was like one of my first jobs. So, um, I actually spoke out on the radio about people with disabilities, you know, finding it hard to find jobs and they got in touch with me through that. And then um, that's how I sort of got that job. I wasn't great at accounting or anything, but um, I was a good help to them. That's all I'll say. Brilliant. And then the biggest thing I think you've done so far, I think it's actually quite great. Um, obviously, because I I don't know if many people in the UK will recognise this, but the RTE is actually your version yes. of the BBC. Is yeah, it? our version of the BBC, yeah. Yeah, and um, and your social media intern, and I thought, wow, that's incredible. Yeah, it was really cool to to get that. Um, like it was great. I got to work with a great team, a great team with an RTE, um, and we would just produce social media content. Um, funny enough, it was. I registered for it when I was in college still and um, I was going to go back to college and then I decided when I got the opportunity to be picked as one of the 15 interns, um, which is really cool. Um, yeah, I decided to take that and um, do my job there. With an RTE, there was a lot of different things going on at the time. Um, so it was quite tough sometimes, but um, yeah, I absolutely love the team and being able to create content and... Um, yeah, doing social media work, which is something I love, was just brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've actually written down one of fifteen selected. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you ever, ever think, oh, I might not get that? At the time, I felt like I was sort of going to get it. I, I like, I don't mean to be like in a in a cocky way or anything, but I don't know. It's just this weird feeling that I had where I was sort of like, oh, I, I don't know. I think I might have a chance here, and um. I think it sort of scared me though when I went in and there was about like 100 and something other people in the room and they were just going to pick down to the last 15. Um, funny enough, I think there was like two stages. So there was a day where you went in and um, you sort of did different tasks and then there was like a little bit of an interview after that. And um, they sort of said that I got it on the interview stage um, because, yeah, it was a bit like hard going in, not being nervous around so many different people. Um, and then just actually getting the call to say, wow, you've got this. And um, at the start, I didn't actually know what which role I had. So we did three weeks of training and then they picked you into your suitable role. And then um, what what show, were you, were you put on a certain show to do social media or social media for the whole channel? Yeah, so the way that it worked was RTE are like BBC where they have radio stations and they have TV as well. Um, so the accounts that I would have managed with my team were um, RTE 2FM, uh, RTE Radio 1, and um, TV-wise it would have been RTE 1, RTE 2, and the RTE player would have been another asset that we would have managed. And um, yeah, it was just like really cool, just sort of surreal. I actually did... Um, I was able to become one of the lead social media people on one of the shows and um, best place to be, which was with um Baz. You wouldn't know who Baz is in the UK, but he's sort of like a like a celebrity over here in Ireland. And um he would travel around Europe and um talk to people who may have emigrated from Ireland. 
And uh, uh, funny enough, I was just remembering a show that I watched. Uh, it was obviously shown on RT, and then, and then it was shown on the BBC over here. And it was a show that Patrick Kirtley did. Yes. And it was um, Unbeatable or something. Uh, yeah. It only ran for two seasons. I mean, I got, they got canned, like most shows, I, I would imagine. <laughs> But yeah, I just know what's another one. Patrick Patrick's quite he's he's a great personality over there, isn't he? Yeah. Patrick's brilliant. Like I got to work with Patrick um a little bit um within his show, which he hosts the Late Late Show in Ireland. Um so I would have worked a little bit on that show. And yeah, he was an absolute lovely fella. Um so yeah, Patrick is is a great like guy and great presenter and he was very easy to work with. He's a comedian as well, isn't he? Yeah, he is a comedian as well, yeah. Yeah. Well, people say comedian, but... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just hope he's not watching this. Um, but, and then you went on to share Ireland Youth Forum for last year. Yeah, the yeah so stuff that I would have done, I would have done a bit of youth work on the side, so these would have been um, sort of with my job, and... Um, on sort of side though so it would have been just youth work I would have done but um yeah so the shared on youth forum was a brilliant thing and um, getting to do that was amazing so what it was about was people from the Republic of Ireland and the north of Ireland coming together and um, sharing their views and sharing their opinions and um hoping to make a better island for us all and um, that was sort of the goal of the whole program so that program was um it was hosted in Dublin sometimes, it was hosted in Belfast sometimes. And um, so, yeah, it was a really good thing. And um, hopefully now they just implement our policies. Well, that's good because, you know, obviously have you, you're having differences sometimes with the two. Oh, yeah. So it's nice that you get on sometimes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think I really changed my perspective as well. Like I um, really got to learn from people who lived in areas maybe that I would never have spoken to. And um, so, yeah, no, it really did show me there's, you know, you know, you know everybody um, in Ireland wants a better future for Ireland, I think. Um, and then this year, you've just um, finished this job, I think, about a month ago. We should just quickly, yeah. this is July. So when it comes yeah. out, it'll be like September. So I'm just letting everyone yeah. out. Film the way before. But you've just finished um, a job on the executive assistant for Enterprise Ireland. Yes, I just finished that job. Um, yeah, Enterprise was a great company. Um, it just unfortunately the job wasn't for me. Um, I'm a very creative person and it was a very businessy world. Um, so it was quite different. Um, I'm glad I tried it, but... Yeah, that was two, like three or four months that I did that job. You know, it was good experience and getting to meet people in there was brilliant. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, it just wasn't for me. And um, yeah. yeah, I just believe in myself like that if you don't like something, don't stick with it. There's no point of wasting your time and the company's time. Um, so yeah, I sort of came to that decision um, of looking for something else, doing a bit of freelance here and there. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm sort of doing at the moment. And um, so, I mean, because um, in the UK, the way it works is we don't tend to get many opportunities for us to be able to get into work. And in Ireland, you're doing amazing. So I suppose <laughs> if, there's a big difference between how it all works. So you get more opportunities in Ireland, it seems, to get into work. I think, yeah, I think in Ireland, the thing is it's a lot smaller country. And um, that's the thing. So I'm lucky enough to live about 40 or 50 minutes outside of Dublin and um, which is of course our capital city so like I hear people's stories disabled people's stories who have to travel from all over Ireland like Cork say for example and they're up at like four or three in the morning just to get to Dublin and um, to get to these events and um, so yeah I, I think with me as well I sort of have tried really hard and um, I've really worked really hard and um, I've been lucky in a sense because I know there's so many people who work very hard and just don't get the opportunities but and um, I don't know, maybe I was in the right place at the right time, you know, at, at, at something. So, yeah, it's been an interesting journey, all right. And um, I hope to do more and um, more work in all the areas that I've sort of done already and um, in the future. How is accessibility in Ireland 
you know, is it relatively easy to get around? Not really, to be honest. Um, it can be quite tough in Ireland. Um, like I, Dublin, the capital city, is quite okay for accessibility and um, would be the best place say, to live in Ireland. But I live 40 minutes outside, so it's quite a bit different. Um, Dublin have their own bus service, which is called Dublin Bus, and we have Bus Erin. So unfortunately, with Bus Erin, all the buses aren't always accessible. So you're let down quite a lot. Um, could be waiting at a bus stop and an inaccessible bus could show up, which is very frustrating. Also, as well with train stations, um, we don't have workers in every train station, like the UK, actually, um, in that sense. So you have to try to ring ahead, book ahead. Um, so I'm lucky enough to be near a station where somebody actually does work there. Um, so I've been able to go free um, to the train and um, I've been able to get into the city centre because people work in those stations as well. Um, so yeah, in Ireland, we still have a long way to go. Accessibility isn't great, to be honest, in the public transport and um, sort of things. But otherwise, um, it's getting a bit better um, on other things. But we have like laws and stuff in place to make sure buildings are accessible and all. But um, yeah, sometimes they can sort of just um, go through the cracks a little bit and get away with things, um, which is unfortunate. But um, yeah, so Ireland is quite okay for accessibility but we still have a long way to go yeah and um how do you think over time uh because obviously people always adapt um and and so it seems like although Ireland in particular isn't ad adapted it's slowly getting better for all disabilities not just md but others as well yeah, yeah, I, I think it, it, it is. I, I think there's some things so that need to be sort of changed. And I'm sort of speaking on the wheelchair user side of things. Um, but invisible disabilities have become such a bigger thing um, within Ireland. And um, there's more support out there for people. I just think the problem with Ireland is the services aren't there. Um, so if we had more services available for disabled people, it would be really good. But unfortunately, yeah, they're not available for um, the majority of us. And... I've heard a few things. I'm not quite sure if I'm technically correct, but um, is all the services and everything get? Is it all gov government controlled? Or is yeah, so yeah, it is government controlled. It's it's sort of like the NHS how that works. Um, but as you know yourself with the NHS, like the services are offered to you, but it can take quite a while to actually access those services. And um, so that's sort of the problem we have here as well. Perfect. And uh, what's your future sort of job in the future? You know, is it a producer, executive producer, you know, contact creator, what? I don't really know, to be honest. I, I Like, I have an interest in many different areas. Um, so I love social media. I love content creation in any way, video editing. I do like a bit of presenting as well. Um, so, yeah, anything within sort of the media area side of things I'd like to get into um, as a future job. I think of my last job, that was sort of the mistake I made where I sort of went into a more corporate businessy role and I want to try and see how it went. But yeah, I think it just sort of proved to me that media is my way to go. And before we go any further with the last couple of questions, um, I see you're a Liverpool fan. Yes, I am indeed. <laughs> and I thought down here, yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm so, guessing Man United, is it? No, oh God, no, no, no. Okay, okay, okay. Chelsea, so you're fine. Okay, okay. Not too. <laughs> but, uh, but, but so, so why Liverpool? Well, in Ireland, the big league is actually the Premier League. Um, weirdly enough, um, our league is there. It's called the League of Ireland, but it's not a really big league. Um, and I think as well for me, it was always easier to access things. Um like the Premier League when you go over to Liverpool the stadium's fully accessible they have everything there that you need whereas my um local club in Ireland um, which would be Gerard United their stadium has fallen apart um, and the uh, quality just for wheelchair users isn't there so um, funny enough though I sort of started supporting Liverpool because my dad my dad was a big Liverpool supporter um, he grew up in the 70s and the 80s when Liverpool were like one of the big successful teams Um. So that's where I sort of came from. And um, yeah, I, I think I then went over to Anfield.
field and um, I just got to experience it and I realised, yeah, you know, I really love Liverpool and it's the club for me. So, yeah. So what uh, tips or what advice would you give people that has the same position as you have? Well, I'd just say to them um, really to um, sort of just don't hide yourself. I really hid myself as a teenager and um, I sort of wanted to be an able-bodied person as such. And so what I would say to them is be proud of who you are and um, be confident in who you are um, because it can quite be a big thing having a disability. But um, I think people forget they're a person as well. And so it's not all of them. It's just a part of them. Um, so just go for your dreams and uh, the sky's the limit. Brilliant. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add to this conversation? Or anything? I, I don't think so. I think, um, yeah, like a lot of things I've done already and um, I've sort of explained already um, in the questions. But um, yeah, I would just say thanks for having me on. Um, it's been a pleasure and um, I really enjoyed it. That's all right. Well, thank you guys for coming on. Voice. Let's go. Voice FM.